This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So it is really a pleasure and an honor for me to very briefly introduce to you our speaker for tonight, who is really a godfather in health policy, or perhaps we can say that he's a renaissance man because of the various activities that he's had over his very productive academic and um, government service in his life. Uh, very briefly, he has in the past served as the dean at the Heller School of uh, social work, uh, excuse me, social policy and management, where he currently is the Saul Taken Professor of National Health Policy. But apart from being a very productive um, academic with many, many books and articles, I think you'll find the fact that he's had a very practical and pragmatic experience of working very closely with government policymakers. And he's been able to infuse policy with the kind of evidence that he's been able to analyze with his own research. And interestingly also is that he has the integrity and the professional reputation that has made him an acceptable professional for both the, the Democrats and the Republicans. So very briefly, um, he served um, as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of HEW under the Nixon administration who, and when he helped to uh, design the administration's plan for universal health care under President Nixon. Um, he's also been, has served as the chair of the Prospective Payment Assessment Commission under President Reagan, under President George H. Bush, and under President Clinton. And for President Clinton, he was also a very active member of the transition team and on the bipartisan commission on the future of Medicare. And finally, and more recently, he has also served as an advisor to the health policy team for uh, President Obama during his presidential campaign. So you can see that he's bringing to us a tremendous wealth and breadth and depth of information and experience of living the history of health policy. So Stuart. Well, thank you. This is. Uh Great homecoming for me. Um, I really, I really, really uh, look forward to coming back to California. Um, I'm a uh, UCLA PhD and taught at uh, Berkeley in the School of Public Policy and Public Health. So anyway, um, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, so what I'm going to try to do this evening is to talk about health care, um, both uh, the issue about reform, which is all about coverage, and the parallel issue about uh, health care costs. Uh, many people put them together. They say, well, you know, how can you restructure, refine, redesign our American system without worrying about these two problems of coverage and cost? And, you know, in a theoretical sense, um, they do go together. Uh, but as I'm going to show you in a little while, what makes good theoretical sense doesn't always make good public policy sense. So I'll talk about why the uh, Affordable Care Act chose to minimize the second issue, but why we need to deal with it. And um, so the, I'm, I'm going to, a few of you may have uh, sat through a lecture I gave here a year or so ago. Um, and I apologize for the fact that uh, the first couple of the slides are similar because I need to take people from the beginning. Now, my definition of the beginning is when I started. 
you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I've been at this now since uh, the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, you're going to see a little um, a PR effort for a book I recently wrote, um, which um, I think it's still available on Amazon. Um, uh, you probably have a, you can get them used, you can get them battered, you know, now that coming around, my students are now, I require reading for all my students, so you probably can get battered books for a couple of bucks. But anyway, it, it traces actually the history of healthcare reform back for 100 years. This is not a new issue for America. And so the question I start out with, you know, it, it basically, why is it so difficult? for this country to create universal coverage when most of our so-called trading partners, most if not all industrial countries, first world countries, have it, what's with us? And, and it is a very legitimate question. So I start out with that issue. And the dilemma, it really is a dilemma, which is if so many Americans really, in principle, support health coverage, why is there such a visual, visual uh, um, an attack on it? And what you find out is that many Americans, not a trivial number of Americans, believe that it might or will, A, cost them a lot of money. And obviously, for some of us, it's, well, am I really my brother's keeper? And if I'm my brother's keeper, how much am I really willing to help my brother? Uh, somehow it's going to lead me to have to pay higher prices, or it's going to reduce my access to care, or it's going to in some way reduce the quality of my care. So while in principle they say, oh, I'm willing to help my fellow Americans, the next question is, but how does it affect me? How does it affect my family? How does it affect my friends? And so we get into this battle. And when they, we do surveys and say, OK, let's look at the people. This is asking the American people. This is not me talking. Well, who really benefits from uh, a universal coverage? And clearly, the majority of them, the blue represents a better off. And you say, OK, who's better off? Clearly, the uninsured. Lower incomes Americans. But then watch how that blue deteriorates. And this was done a year or two ago. If I ran, if they ran this survey again, I suspect that blue would be much smaller. Then you get to the country as a whole, 37 percent. One of the big groups that have opposed the ACA, surprise of surprises, have been people over the age of 65. And as I've done, and my wife will tell you, you know, when I engage in people, because I'm not quiet about this issue, and, and they go ranting and raving about government and how government is going to do all the things. I said, are, are you on Medicare? They said, well, yeah, what's that got to do with it? I said, well, somehow government is providing you with health care. Yeah, but that's different. <laughs> One guy in particular that I knew well, after he was ranting and raving, I said, uh, would you give me your Social Security number? He said, well, why? I said, well, I'm going to take you off Medicare. <laughs> he said, what? I said, well, you've just been screaming and yelling and running and uh, 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 about all the, and not only am I going to take you off Medicare, but I'm going to see you get all your money back. Every dollar. So give me your Social Security number. He said, well, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so anyway, the, but the reality is that the majority of seniors view themselves as potential losers. Um, and as I said, 37%, uh, 35%, your state, people on Medicaid, and so on and so forth. So you can see, and I bring this up because there's this strong continued opposition that has only gotten worse, of course, as we've run into these minor little problems like our computer system is not working and people finding it's costing them more money. But this was done before all that. So now, let's go back. This is an issue that has been a focus 
of almost all presidents, going all the way back, not to Theodore Roosevelt, to you know, to Teddy Roosevelt, and and even you know, Theodore Roosevelt during the Depression, when he faced the idea of what he was going to do, and he chose, after all, to create the Social Security program in 1935, he chose to back away and not introduce health care reform. Lyndon Johnson, probably our most powerful president in terms of social legislation, yes, he passed Medicare and Medicaid, but he too chose not to push for universal coverage. Truman, on the other hand, when he ran for re-election after the Second World War, advocated a government-run total universal coverage, which was Interestingly enough, he was elected, but his program got absolutely no place. And then, ironies of all ironies. Now, I, sus I don't even want to ask you, but I would suspect in this group, not a lot of you go to bed at night and saying, gee, I loved Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was a wonderful man. Um, you know, and the truth of the matter is I worked for him, and I would agree with you, you know? <laughs> I didn't love him either. But uh, for those of you who you know invest the dime or know about this, he's got. If you read about the history of, health, of not only health care, civil rights, a variety of other programs during the Nixon administration, he was a strange duck. And and um, I'm in California, so promise. Oh, this is even on tape. Uh, maybe I better not tell the story. Well. When Richard Nixon became president, he brought with him from California two very distinct group of people. And they were, they, they, there was a group of, in the current vernacular, would be moderate to liberals. They were Republicans, uh, but they were very different. And then there was another group who were not so moderate and not so liberal. And they all came from this great state of yours. Um, and I won't uh, mention names. But uh, the truth is that under Richard Nixon, and I'm going to show you this in a minute, one of the most moderate to liberal reforms was put forward. And I'm going to talk about that. And then you had Carter and Clinton. So all we've dealt with this problem and tried to deal with this ongoing. But in each case, these presidents either backed away completely or when they tried to do it, they failed. So when we take on the current debate and the creation of what ultimately became uh, the Affordable Care Act, you have to bring in play what took place. Now, we had before, you know, we're going to go back a little in time, and we had the first uh, nomination for the who was going to be the presidential candidate of the Democratic Party. And at that point, there were three uh, high-level contenders. Uh, there was um, a senator, Edwards, who has sort of had his problems. But, uh, and then there was Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. And in all cases, all three of them decided, A, they were going to make health care an important issue. And, and just by taking that on, the question was, what were they going to do? As I said, it's all in the book. <laughs> That's what it looks like. I didn't bring any copies, but um, if you're interested in it, it goes into it in some detail. Now, first of all, let me talk just a little about Richard Nixon. How many of you remember Richard Nixon? I mean, we got a few. <laughs> well, we got a few young people here who have this. Gun. Few of you are, have the same gray hair. So let me set the stage. Richard Nixon becomes president, 1968. The country was still living in, in the, the 60s era. There was major reform in place. We had passed Medicare in 1966. Um, and there was a very active that Medicare was stage one and that we were going to go to true universal coverage. Um, a committee of 100 was formed, led by Walter Ruther, head of the unions, to create a true national, all government-funded system. Senator uh, Ted Kennedy, 
uh, became ultimately the chairman of that group, and the expectation was something was going to happen. Now, I entered the scene in 1971 as an economist. Um, how a kid from the Bronx war wound up in the Nixon administration, I do not talk about sober. <laughs> the wine is not enough for me to go, go into that. You didn't give me enough of it. A few drinks, you'll get me going. <laughs> but the reality was, there I was in 1971 as the chief health policy person for the HEW at the time. Um, and, um, and I had a vague past there. You know, I, you, you, know, you look back on your life and you say to yourself, you know, where was I before? I wasn't trained. There wasn't, wasn't trained as a health economist. There were very few of us, few people in that field. It's now, you know, now they're by the thousands. But then you could literally count them on one hand. And in Washington, there were only 10, 15 people in the field. Now, you know, there's phone books. You know, they have phone books, health analysts. I mean, they're, you know, and they're a thousand pages thick. Then it was, it wouldn't even have, you know, made a little book. So um, we were there in 1971, and I found myself being asked by this group of people to look at health care reform. Now, we had gone through a, a period where the AMA, we have physicians in the group, a few physicians, any left? Yeah. The AMA was not always the most positive force <laughs> when it came to health care reform. And they were intensely, they thought they were going to slit their wrists with the passage of Medicare. Um, so, but they decided they couldn't be opposed to it. The insurance industry couldn't be opposed to it. The hospitals couldn't be. But everybody had a plan. And for those of you who remember the early 70s. And so this, we were going to have health care reform. The New York Times would have headlines. You know, it's going to happen. It's just a question of which plan and when it's going to happen. And um, so the Nixon administration had to have a plan. It came up with one plan. It wasn't exciting. And then the president let it be known to the, my boss, who was named Casper Weinberger, also from California, um, had been the budget director here. He, he used to be called Cap the Knife. Uh, but he, in turn, when it came to this, he said to me, Stuart, we want a comprehensive plan that really provides decent care. We don't want it all run by the government, but we realize that the government can you believe Republicans saying this? We realize that the government should play a role. You help design this plan. And so this is now 1973. There was this minor break-in. <laughs> and I forgot where it was, but it was, it was a, you know, people kept calling me, you know, Do you, what's going on in Washington? Now, you know, do you know what's going on in Watergate? Truth of the matter is, I didn't know. I didn't care. Healthcare reform was more important. And, and, and it affected everything. So here we were in 1973. And Nixon, we meet. And, and not his cabinet was always so. They were more Republicans. They were a little nervous about all this kind of stuff. Anyway, he pushes through. And in January of 1974, in the State of the Union, he puts forward a bill. The big forces on the Hill was Senator Kennedy in the Senate and a congressman by the name of Wilbur Mills. Some of you remember Wilbur Mills, who the, was really responsible for the passage of Medicare. And they had been opposed. And they lock together, and they say, OK, the president has proposed a plan. We are going to favor his plan. We're going to make it a little more liberal. And in the spring of 1974, they all agree. And now we're going to have national health reform. And a couple of things happen. And that's why I get to the next slide. And the question is, if no Watergate, and remember Fannie Fox, 
<laughs> now, for those of you who are young, which means under the age of 60, uh, <laughs> you may not remember this completely. Fanny Fox was a very attractive stripper who somehow became part of the folklore of America because it turned out that Wilbur Mills, this good congressman from Arkansas, who would, and I worked with his staff, I worked with him, and he was a legend. He would come in bleary-eyed in the morning. I said, oh, the congressman spends his nights reading the tax codes. <laughs> he is working so hard. Well, it turns out, we found out later, that every night a full fifth of scotch was consumed. And he went after Fanny Fox up in Boston, and then he fell into the tidal basin, and he got himself into trouble. Richard Nixon got himself into trouble. This all took place in 1974, and what happened? Health care reform went kaput. So, as we think about health care reform, and I'm going to show you in a minute, I'm going to show you the similarities between the Nixon plan, a plan put gross by a, 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 a Senator Dole, that what was supported in, in Massachusetts, and the Obama plan. And you're going to see how similar they are. This idea that we've created this radical plan out of nowhere, a government takeover, is just so much hooey. So let's back up a second. And you uh, talk about what you're going to talk about in your next session, and you're absolutely right. Basically, to simplify the world, if you're going to think seriously about universal coverage, you can go down one of three paths. You can go down some form of government payment system, Medicare for all, a different form of where essentially we collect taxes and people are covered, and then the government, one way or the other, either directly or through um, subsidiaries or surrogates, uh, pays for the care. Or we can take our current complicated, confusing, non-equal American system and try to make it work better. Or we can try the so-called Republican plan, which is to eliminate coverage. We now get subsidized for getting our insurance through our employer. We can wipe that out. We can provide vouchers to people who can buy coverage. And these are the, th and then you can have a thousand variations of these three options. And not surprising, well, it is surprising, when the three candidates, Edwards, Hillary Clinton, and Obama looked at this plan, they all decided for option two, to take our current complicated, confusing, inequitable, unequal, but uniquely American system. <laughs> hey, listen, Americans don't do simple things. <laughs> I, when people come, we need to make our system simple. You know what I say to them? You are un-American. <laughs> un-American. Not only that, as a consultant, I find that offensive. <laughs> you, a consultant, do not want simple things. So anyway, I, and so not, not surprisingly, I've been advocating option two for the last 50 years as well, uh, for two reasons. One, I think it's the only thing that can get through America. And two, it's so confusing that people have to keep coming to me. <laughs> and to you, you know, to all these researchers, you know, life is, if it was simple, we wouldn't need all your research. Just work, right? OK, so now I want to show you the issue. So these are the, here's the Nixon plan, the Dole Chapey plan. The Romney plan, which is basically Massachusetts and the Obama plan. And you'll notice how many yeses there are across the board. So if you look at the Nixon plan, there are only two no's. What are the two no's? Was there an individual mandate? No. Was there a state-based purchasing exchange? No. Well, of course, this is 1971. Typing was a big deal. <laughs> Computers, you know, they would have been better off. But so there was no no. You'll know other than that, and a few other cases, 
the plans are remarkably the same. And that is to take this complicated system and try to make it more equitable, to try to make it more universal, to try to make it work. And as we're going to talk about in a little while, when we go to the problems we're now having with the exchanges, bear in mind what we've tried to do, what these people have tried to do. They have tried to take, you know, I was a Rube Goldberg fan when I was growing up, which is how you can try to find the most complicated way of doing the simplest thing, which is basically the way the Americans have created their health insurance. As I said, I love it. Most people don't. But, and so what this system is trying to do is make it work better. Not surprisingly, when you try to computerize all of the pieces that have to fit together, it turns out to be very hard. Now, I'm not here defending all of the different people who've been involved in the exchanges, but they were asked to do the impossible. And it has to do with this, because basically it was trying to deal with many different constituents. Now, let's just play the game out a little more. The three most contentious issues during the, during the fight over the, of the Affordable Care Act was what should we do about health care costs? Should we have, if not a single payer system, a public option? And three, must we ask everybody to buy insurance, the so-called individual mandate? So let's go through them. First of all, why did the reform not include serious controls on health care spending? Several more than years than I can count, I created Altman's Law. What did Altman's Law say? Altman's Law has basically said nearly, nearly every major interest group favors universal coverage and health system reform. But if the plan deviates from their preferred approach, they would rather retain the status quo. And that includes the AMA, the American Hospital Association, the Nurses Association, it doesn't matter. And the single biggest issue that separates out the healthcare community from healthcare reform is serious cost containment. Because you start dealing with serious cost containment and everybody in this big industry of ours, and several of you are part of it, gets very nervous because it begins to affect them. Whether you're dealing with the hospitals or the doctors or the insurance companies or the pharmaceutical industry or the equipment manufacturers or the ad, you go on and on and on. Everybody, you know, this isn't, and for those of you who don't know, this is approaching, you know, 2.8 plus trillion dollars. 18% of our GDP feeds a lot of us. And it's one thing to talk theoretical. It's another thing to talk about your real income. And so dealing with serious cost containment has in the past separated out. Did it make sense to include it? Yes. Was it politically foolhardy to include it? Absolutely. And so we learned. Clinton, if you go back, and look at the, the fiasco in the Clinton plan, it was over cost containment. It was over how do you slow the growth. And all of a sudden, all the groups got very nervous. So Obama and Hillary and decided that they were going to do it tomorrow. Same thing in Massachusetts. So therefore, we did not include serious cost containment. In my view, had we included serious cost containment in the original legislation, it never would have passed. Never would have passed. Because for the first time, the first time, every major health group, including the AMA, including the hospitals, including the insurance industry, supported the Affordable Care Act. That doesn't mean every doctor approved it. That doesn't mean every insurance company approved it. But no major group in the healthcare community opposed the Affordable Care Act. And even today, even today, no major group has come out against it. That does you know, the Chamber of Commerce may have come out against it, the magnet, this and that, but no major health group 
Again, I'm not saying every doctor, I'm not saying every hospital, I'm not saying every pharmaceutical company. And the reason is that they all see the potential for benefit. And, and so I, it was a real, I think it was the positive thing. The second issue, the public plan, which some people said came out of this part of the world. And so actually, some people give credit to a former student of mine who was a professor at the School of Public Health at Berkeley. So what was the public plan? Well, it was an attempt to put together a competing force to uh, these private insurance run by the government. And a lot of people said, well, why not? I mean, we're going to have competition. Well, behind the scenes, it turned into a huge fight. Who'd be eligible for this public plan? Would it be just certain groups? Would it be bigger groups? First, it was just individuals uninsured. Then it was small groups. Then it was bigger groups. How, how would the plan pay providers? Remember how government works. Government dictates prices. So all of a sudden, a lot of hospitals began to get nervous. You mean to tell me you're going to have this public plan, and they're going to have the power of government behind them? Are they going to start paying us like Medicare? Or worse, are they going to start paying us like Medicaid? Well, are you sure? And then they said, well, look at all the money you're going to save on administrative costs. Look at all these wasted money on the insurance companies. We said, well, wait a minute. The way so Medicare works, the reason why it's so uh, cost efficient is that everybody's on it. You don't have to have advertisements. You just, you know, you know, get 65, you get a letter, you're on Medicare. Um, so how are you going to save all this money? And so while the public plan took a lot of publicity on the outside, made a lot of sense, I thought it was a pretty good idea, politically, it, many people believed it was dead from the beginning. Now, again, people are now looking at it and said, if we had only had a single payer system, wouldn't these exchanges have been so simple? And the answer is yes. Look at all the confusion we have that would have disappeared if we had a single payer public plan. But this is America. We remember, we don't do simple things. So what makes sense theoretically, politically, uh, uh, theoretically, didn't make sense. And in fact, you can make a case. If the public plan had stayed in the Senate proposal and it looked like it was going to stay, but it really didn't. In my view, health care reform never would have passed. You may disagree. We can talk about it. So where are we today? So we had a Supreme Court ruling, which confused everybody. I mean, you know, it, it, it was a big surprise. They, five to four, voted that, in fact, it could stay on because it was really a tax. Um, and they said, oh, but there's this one minor problem. Uh, you're requiring every state, to, everybody to have Medicaid expansion. Every state can decide. And of course, we've had World War III over which states are going to cover Medicaid and which aren't going to cover. In my view, even today, health care reform, the future of it is still uncertain. With each passing day, on the one hand, we're getting more people on, but the confusion is there. It is not going to be a guaranteed deal, I think, for another five years. I sort of view it as, yeah, the baby's born, um, and it's maybe, it maybe hasn't quite reached toddler stage, but if we're, you know, we gotta spend a lot of time making sure that it works. So why does the administration have such a hard time implementing health care reform? And again, let me say it for the fourth time. We have taken by far the most complicated system the world has ever tried to do and make it work. Again, not to, you know, I, I think a lot of it was a fiasco, but um, um, it is a tough job. So <clears throat> now we get to the one of the, so the one thing is the technical aspects of it, which is getting those exchanges to work. The second part of it is getting the right combination of people signing up for the plan. And of course, some of you are in this category of the young, healthy invincibles. What are we asking? And then we get to the mandate. So when, during the debate o over who was going to be the representative of the Democratic Party, and Senator Clinton came up with her plan, and Senator Obama came up with his plan, 
If you remember, the single difference that separated the two was the individual mandate. And I'll remember this as long as I live. I was an advisor to Senator Obama, and he said, I will not have a mandate. I will not have a mandate. We said, sir, you need a mandate. You need to get everybody covered. You need to get the state or the, I don't care, he said. If you have a mandate, you are going to be requiring large numbers of people who are just above the poverty line to buy private insurance they can't afford. I will not support a mandate. But, sir, if you don't, I don't care. Okay? He's the boss. The Obama plan did not have a mandate. The Clinton plan did. And if you remember the debates, Hillary Clinton saying to him, you know, Senator, how are you going to make sure everyone is covered? His answer back, Mrs. Clinton, how are you going to prevent people from not signing up? Are you going to throw them in jail? And ironies of ironies, what happens? Obama wins. And the first thing that happens is that the people in Washington said, you have to have a mandate. <laughs> and he said, oh, OK. <laughs> Well, he didn't quite say it like that, but the reality was you needed a mandate in the system in order to glue it together. Now, we in Massachusetts have a mandate, and it sort of works. You know, it, you know, bitching and moaning and groaning, people have signed up, including younger people, but it takes time. You know, if you're a young, if you're 25 years old and you haven't been sick and stuff like that, and somebody says, and you're making money, you're a roofer, you're a carpenter, you're whatever, and you know, you're not making a zillion dollars, but you have a living, and somebody says, you know, it's going to cost you, I don't know, $500 a month, whatever, and stuff like that, you say, for what? I don't want it. Well, what we found is that it didn't, the first group and the second group didn't sign up, but by the third time, after a while, they began, you know, and besides, some of them actually got married and they began to have families and, and, and for whatever reason. And so give it time, it will take, but it is not a sure thing. And again, as I said, this individual mandate, which, as I said, he opposed, really is critical. Now, here is one of the issues which I will admit I am not a big fan of. So if you look, I mean, let's, I'm not telling you anything at a school, older people need more health care than younger people, unfortunately. The older I get, the more unfortunate it is. <laughs> so if you look actuarially, the difference between the average care of a 55 to 60-year-old versus a 25 to a 30-year-old is between 5 and 6 to 1. In other words, it costs five times more to insure a 55 to 60-year-old than it costs to a 25 to 30-year-old. And so the insurance industry, left alone, they said, OK, if you're part of a big group, we'll charge everyone the same, whether you're 25 or 55, whether you have wonderful health care or you're sick. If you're a part of the UC system, you all, we were Brandeis, you know, we don't worry about it. But if you're part of an individual or a small group, we are going to what we call, uh, you know, um, actuarially determine um, your premium. And we're going to charge you more if you're older. We're going to charge you more and not even let you be insured if you are, have a previous medical condition, um, because it's going to cost us more to insure you. Well, the Affordable Care Act said, first of all, you cannot charge people more if they have any form of pre-existing medical condition. From a social point of view, that makes all kind of sense. Well, second, we said, well, how much more should we really charge older, sicker people versus young and healthy people? And so it became a huge fight. And we took that 6 to 1 and made it 3 to 1. So now, let's play this out. In order to make this system work, we have to get young, healthy people to buy insurance. 
And what did we do? We said to them, not only are we going to ask you to buy insurance that you don't even think you want or need, but we're going to make you pay more than the actuarial cost of that insurance. And we're going to make you buy all kinds of insurance that you don't want. And the answer is because it's good for the country. <laughs> and you know what they say? I can't say it. <laughs> And we say, but you know, but, but it's good for the country. And besides, you're going to get old. And someday you're going to need it. I'll worry about it then. So now, you know, I'm over 35. <laughs> I believe in all this kind of stuff like that. So it's very easy for me to support three to one. Hell, in New York, it's one to one. New York, you can't even differentiate it. You know, but that's New York, you know? So, um, so now we are paying the price. So not surprisingly, trying to get these people to sign up is going to be a hard job. Some of them are going to be subsidized and so on and so forth. And I end, look, I'm not here. I understood why we went to three to one. I understand why we, we uh, didn't want to let pre-existing medical conditions. It's socially the right thing to do. But when you do it in an, it's one thing if you do it in a single payer concept. It's another thing if we're going to ask these people to buy it. Anyway, we've got to live with it. It's the right thing to do. My own view is we should subsidize them. We should do whatever. Uh, personally, I would have phased it in. I would have gone from six to one to four to one. To three. But you know, they didn't listen to me on this stuff. And so we now, if you want to know why we're having a problem, I just want to tell you. So. We're now living with it. I think we're going to make it work. I think it's far from a done deal, but it is moving forward. I believe we will get these technical things solved. I do believe this issue about the cost of health care is not going to go away, and we're going to have to deal with it. So interestingly enough, how ironic, the insurance industry is actually working very closely with the Obama people, because they both can lose by this thing going wrong. And now you got the Republicans, who are against the Affordable Care Act, attacking the Obama people because they're too close to the insurance industry. How ironic. <laughs> How ironic. So the latest gamut is the, the uh, administration in Washington is trying to create risk corridors so that the insurance industries don't get killed by having too many sick people so that they don't have to raise their premium. And so now we're calling it bailouts. Um, OK. So let's move on. What about this issue of costs? It's one thing not to cover initially in the first go around in the Affordable Care Act. But if you leave costs uncontrolled, over time, it will just drive the system. So what did the Accountable Care Act do? It set in place of a number of what we call delivery system demonstrations or options. It said, OK, we need to change the delivery system, change its structure. But we exactly don't know exactly how. So what we're going to do is we're going to set in place a number of these options. And we're going to experiment. So the question becomes, what impact will all this have on the spending growth? So we have now, it's been several years, and we have an organization called the Innovation Center, which is spending a billion dollars a year for 10 years to try to help to restructure the delivery system. And I'm not going to go into it. It's a very complicated. But they are trying to move our system away from fee-for-service. For those of you who are not privy, basically, the American health system pays for care on a piecemeal basis, which is, after all, the way most of things are done. You go to the movies, you pay for it. You don't go to the movies, you don't pay for it. You go to the restaurant, you pay for it. You don't go to the restaurant, you don't pay for it. Well, that sounds fine. 
And the healthcare system works the same way. You go to the doctor, you pay for it. You go to the hospital, you pay for it. You don't go to the hospital, you don't pay for it. You don't go to the doctor. FIFA service. Why not do it? And that's what we've been doing. Oh, there were a couple of wacko groups here in California that didn't believe in this thing. So, little side story. I'm a young 1971, and I'm in my office, and I get a knock at the door, and this guy walks in, and he says to me, um, he says, hi, my name is blank blank, and he says, and you have my job. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, you, you got to hear this closely, you are the deputy assistant secretary for planning and evaluation slash health. And I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health slash Planning and Evaluation. <laughs> we have the same job. I said, oh, well, that's interesting. So he sat down and I said, well, who are you? He said, my, my name is so and so. And I, and I said, well, where'd you come from? He said, well, I'm a senior, I've been just a senior vice president on this group called the Kaiser Foundation and Health Plan. And I, I said, What's that? <laughs> and he starts explaining to me, well, they have these hospitals and these doctors, and they all work together. Now, remember, it's 1971, and I'm still thinking of the 60s. I said, it sounds like a commune to me, personally. <laughs> I said, what else do you do at Kaiser? <laughs> I'm thinking, this may not be such a bad deal. Uh, so he starts explaining to me, and I said, Sounds like a commie plot to me. I mean, you guys just sound like you're doing things together. It's like a commune. It's like, and he said, well, let me explain it a little more. And the more I explained it, the more I began to like it. I mean, you know, the idea of moving away from FIFA service and having a premium where the healthcare community worries about your health rather than being sick. So anyway, this had been around for a long time. And it has grown in other parts of the country. And so we have been trying since the early 70s to restructure the payment system to move more and more in that direction. But every time we do it, there are these forces that kick us back into the FIFA service world. And I don't have time to go into all that kind of stuff like that. We passed the HMO Act in 1973 to get more of these involved. We were very much involved in the 1990s. In, you know, until all the movies and the television, you know, blasted this as not managing care, but managing, you remember all that kind of stuff. So we're now playing this out again. I mean, this is not just a history lesson. This exact set of discussions that went on in 1971 and went on again in 1991 are going on again today. How do we restructure the payment for health care to move away from paying for doing to paying for not doing, for paying for getting, keeping people healthy. And so that's what these experiments are all about. And in the process, the hope is to slow the growth in spending. And we've had some successes in them. But there are a lot of other forces at work. Now, I do want to show you something that's encouraging. This represents the rate of growth rate of growth in healthcare spending since the early 1970s. Now, this was the era. You know, these were growth rates per year, 10, 6, 13, 11. Then we went all the way down. Then we went back up in the early 2000 period. And since around 19, it's beginning in around 2005, it's been coming down. And over the last couple of years, it's been as low and as flat as we've seen it. The question before the House is whether that will continue or not. If it does, it has tremendous positive implications for how we move forward in our health system. The question is, is it, is it because of these changes that are going on? Is it because of the recession that we had? There are a lot of economists that are trying to sort this out. So some believe that the current slowdown will be permanent. We are seeing positive changes in the system. Providers, hospitals, doctors are becoming more efficient. Hospital-acquired infections that nobody wants, um, which are very expensive and, not, and bad for your health, uh, are coming down. 
rehospitalizations. We have, it's hard to believe, but almost 20% of patients who go out from the hospital wind up within a period of 30 to 60 days back in the hospital for the same conditions. Some of it is unavoidable, but lots of it is because they, they either don't follow the instructions, no one cares for them, they sort of fall into an abyss. And now what we're saying, I don't know, anybody here work for a hospital? Anybody work for a hospital? Not too many. So what we have said to the hospitals, we, the government, has said to the hospitals, you are going to be responsible for your patients after they leave the hospital. And you know what the hospitals say? What, are you kidding? <laughs> I did my job. They came in. They needed a new hip. I replaced the hip. They needed a new what's he does it I replaced it. They left. They were OK. What do you want from me? We turned them over to the, to the whatever. We gave them a piece of, how many of you have been in a hospital? Yeah? <laughs> they give you a piece of, I was in a hospital, they give you a piece of paper and they go, you know, you want a home health, you want to go to rehab, you know, you want to go to Bermuda. <laughs> go. And oh, by the way, we'll call you in another couple of months. And so you know what the government's saying? Not good enough. We're going to hold you responsible. And if your rehospitalization beats a certain condition, you're not going to get paid. Anyway, the hospitals are doing it. And so we're seeing all these positive things, more patient cost sharing, greater use of tiered networks. We have less expensive tech. There's a whole bunch of things going on. And the net problem is that we are beginning to see that health care is coming down. And government can be a major force. Now, I'm going to go through the rest of it fairly quickly, but it is the beginning. The reality is that the healthcare system, regardless of the, is now increasingly going to be government payment. So if you are in the healthcare business, whether you're a hospital or a doctor, you will have to recognize that you're going to be living with less money. The average hospital, I did this slide, well, Afrat's here. Remember Afrat? You know, I need you back because I can't. Uh, my my former assistant is now, you know, a big shot here in California. I don't know how to fix the slide. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, it's not easy to do. I'm waiting for the health care reform to work its way out before I fix it. The reality is that the average hospital is going to see a significant increase in their payment from from the government. And the Affordable Care Act is only going to make it more so. The point here is that, is that increasingly the healthcare community is going to have to live with payments from government. What the healthcare community has done up to this point is relied on private insurance to make up for the gap. And the biggest culprit in the United States, except for one other state, is the state of California. There's one other state. West Virginia, which is worse, which means the gap between what private insurance pays for care relative to its costs and the, is the widest. And the reason is that you have a, ver, a, you know, a fairly extensive Medi-Cal system, but it doesn't pay a lot. So the point here is that this gap is not going to be maintained. It can't be maintained. You're going to be seeing more and more restrictions on private insurance. Why? Because we're asking employers and employees to pay for rates they can't keep paying for. The, the bottom line of all this is that states will be asked to play a more active role in controlling total spending. And we in Massachusetts are heading again the game. And we have a law that is created to try to keep control without having regulation. And we're trying to do it with a lot of different things, with different forms of payment, with reviewing things, with all these different programs. I'm working in, uh, with people here in C California, in Oregon, and stuff like that. States are going to be playing more of an active game. There is a commission, which I chair, called the Health Policy Commission, which is responsible again, for trying to make the private system work better. 
a job is not a regulatory job. It's to make providers work of themselves more efficient, to help them lower costs, to help payers change the way they pay for care, to move towards more of these global payments. We don't call them capitation anymore, bad word, but it's the same thing. Help consumers understand how to get your care, that more is not necessarily better. Don't push the envelope. Don't require every test and procedure, even if your doctor says you don't need it. And maybe even if your doctor says you do need it, to question whether you really need it or not. To assure the restructuring of the system. Our goal is to get the growth rate in spending along with the growth rate in our income. One of the things I want to make clear, we are not talking about growth declining. This is America. We're not going to do that. It, but if we can re reduce the growth rate along with the growth in our income, we have a chance of supporting what we can support. Now, actually, we've actually been OK. If, first of all, Massachusetts is a very expensive state. So this is a some blue line. By the way, California, to its credit, is really significantly below this. But you'll notice that since 2009, both the federal spending and the Massachusetts spending has been in line with our income, which means the percentage of our income going to health care has sort of flattened out, actually reduced a little bit. And we're hoping that that could continue. Now, again, I just want to emphasize, we're not a regulatory body. Ultimately, the responsibility is with the private sector. So people ask me all the time, what are you if you're not a regulatory body? Well, I say, we're like the health system's mother. That's me over there. <laughs> Our job is to make sure that the healthcare community eats its vegetables, to do, does the right thing. And the bottom line is that the healthcare community is going to have to learn to live with less of a reduction in revenue. So, can it be done without lowering quality? That's our job. We need to make sure that spending is reduced, but not in a way that does not negatively affect quality. So bringing this to the end, this fragile child of healthcare reform is moving forward and growing up. It's not over. It is far from a done deal. But along with it is this attempt to slow the growth in costs. Am I optimistic? Yes. I think we've made tremendous progress. Am I concerned? Absolutely. So with that, I will stop and uh, answer questions. But I've tried to take you through the history and where we are today. So thank you very much. <laughs>